Tonight, a tale of two speakers and two historic votes. As your speaker, I will restore quickly, bring back the honor to this chamber. MPs elect Canada's first black speaker with the job of restoring order to the House. While in the U.S., disorder and chaos as Republicans give their own speaker the boot. Riders stranded, trains stopped in their tracks. We were stuck in that spot for about two and a half, three hours. A system failure derails a commute in Canada's biggest city. And artificial intelligence is changing how we work. What are you afraid of in this moment? I'd like to still have a job next year. Is it a threat or an opportunity? We break down the debate. Learn how to use it so it isn't used against you. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with breaking news in Manitoba. Voters have chosen a new premier, and this too is a matter of history. NDP leader Wab Canoe is now the first First Nations premier of a Canadian province. Uh, Wab, how's it feel to make history? That's Canoe being met by a crush of supporters tonight at NDP headquarters. They have a lot to celebrate with enough seats to form a majority government. Cam McIntosh is at NDP headquarters in Winnipeg tonight. Cam, what a moment for Wab Canoe and, and the whole Manitoba NDP. Absolutely, and I'm still standing here, and the party is still going here, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon, Adrian. This has been seven years in the making for the Manitoba NDP, seven years in the making for Wab Canoe as the leader of that party, and, you know, to become the first First Nations person who will lead a Canadian province. It is a significant milestone both here in Manitoba and nationally. While the polls indicated it was a strong prob probability all through the campaign, it was never a certainty. Wab Canoe went out with a positive message. He talked about health care reform, but in the campaign, the issue of his past as a young man uh, with some criminal charges that he's been pardoned for did come up in the campaign. He spoke to that, saying that the troubles he had as a young Indigenous person were the reason that he was running. He also spoke about that today in his victory speech. Take a listen. I was given a second chance in life. And I would like to think that I've made good. And so to young people who are looking for a positive path, I want to share the words that my father always told us. Andobuachigek. Seek your vision. Seek your vision. Dreams come true. Yeah. Yeah. Wab Canoe speaking about his vision there, and as of tonight, he now has a majority government to see through his vision for Manitoba. And so, Cam, we also heard from the outgoing Premier Heather Stephenson. She delivered her own news about her future. That's right. It's a disappointing night for Manitoba's progressive conservatives who have been in power for the last seven years. Heather Stephenson became premier two years ago when she took over that position from ex-premier Brian Pallister. Today in her concession speech, she announced that she will not be continuing on as the party leader. Also stepping down as party leader tonight, the liberal leader Dougal Lamont, who failed to win his own seat. So the political landscape of Manitoba is changing drastically tonight. And... There is a historic moment here for the rest of the country in the election of the first First Nations Premier of a Canadian province. Adrian? All right, thanks for your reporting tonight. Cam McIntosh in Winnipeg. Now to that other historic vote. This one in Ottawa. The House of Commons now has a brand new speaker. Liberal MP Greg Fergus is the first black person elected to that job, and he has his work cut out for him, restoring confidence in the House after his predecessor led a standing ovation for a man with Nazi ties. There were a lot of people vying for the job. Ashley Burke with Greg Fergus's message to his fellow MPs when he landed it. Welcome to the new... Tradition demands Liberal MP Greg Fergus at least appear like he doesn't want this new job. But in truth, it's been his dream for years. Thank you for the applause. I know that uh, in politics, the... Uh, 
there are only two times when people are, give you a strong applause and they're happy to see you, the day you arrive and of course the day you leave. Fergus arrived on the Hill in 1988 as a parliamentary page. He sat at the foot of the Speaker's chair. Now he's making history sitting in it. Mr. Speaker, today you are the first black Canadian to become Speaker of this House. There's going to be kids who maybe have come here and not seen themselves reflected on the walls. And that's going to change now. That change happened suddenly after his predecessor stepped down last week. I reiterate my profound regret for my error. In Anthony Rota honored a 98-year-old Second World War veteran in the House and later said he didn't realize Yaroslav Hunka served in a Nazi unit. The events of September 22nd were unfortunate, embarrassing and hurtful. MPs on the ballot to replace Rhoda pitch their plans to restore Parliament's reputation. I will invite Jewish community leaders from across the country, as well as veterans groups who were also affected by what happened this past Friday, to this place to apologize as your speaker. Fergus said he's the right person to fix the damage done. What brought us here today requires a response. Words matter. Symbols matter. Yes, I know. Not long after, Fergus was on the job asking MPs to behave. Please treat me like that new car and don't give it a dent on the first day. <laughs> His pledge to act as a referee that ensures the rules are followed fairly and consistently in an often unruly house. Ashley, it seems that there are now questions about whether Greg Fergus's predecessor did actually follow the rules. Yeah, Adrian, the Speaker is the only one who can recognize people in the House. Green Party co-chair Elizabeth May said that she asked Anthony Rhoda on multiple occasions to honor people that she felt deserve recognition, but Rhoda said no. In April, Rhoda emailed MPs reminding them of the guidelines, that those recognized have to be heads of state, parliamentary delegations, or eminent Canadians like Nobel Prize winners. And the Speaker's office said that technically the House wasn't sitting when Rhoda recognized Yaroslav Hanka, so those gu guidelines don't apply. But May says this whole incident could have been avoided if Rhoda just followed his own rules. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa. Now to history made in Washington tonight. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has become the first to ever be voted out of office. Katie Simpson with the chaos on Capitol Hill and why it's not over yet. One of the most powerful figures in Washington now gone. Kevin McCarthy cannibalized by the far right members of his own Republican Party. Eight of them teaming up with Democrats enough for a majority vote to oust him. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. Silence after an unprecedented moment, a sign of a chamber in shock. Some Republicans barely contained their anger. The chair declares the House in recess, subject to the call of the chair. My colleagues and I who don't support Kevin McCarthy... Anger directed mostly at Matt Gates, the Florida Republican leading the coup. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. Gates triggered the vote after McCarthy worked with Democrats to pass a short-term spending bill to keep the government open. Think long and hard before you plunge us into chaos because that's where we're headed. Pleased to save McCarthy's job did not sway Democrats. They're mad because McCarthy coddled Donald Trump after January 6th and is trying to impeach President Joe Biden. Most insults were hurled at Gates, who sent out fundraising messages amid the chaos. Oh, look at that. Oh, look, give me money. I filed the motion to vacate using official actions, official actions to raise money. It's disgusting. McCarthy says he won't run again for speaker and that he's at peace with his choices. Doing the right thing isn't always easy, but it is necessary. McCarthy's only regret, he says, was to help elect the eight Republicans who ousted him. The House is now adjourned until next Tuesday. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. CN Rail is apologizing tonight after an internet outage that disrupted the evening commute in Canada's biggest city. Thomas Daigle now with the system failure that left so many scrambling. 
at a rail station that sees 200,000 riders a day commuting to and from Toronto's suburbs, no one was getting home in a hurry. There's no train time, so I don't know what time the train is leaving. And I found out the whole system's not working, which is insane. This has been going on apparently for hours now. Just as the evening rush began, there were no via rail or regional trains moving. The message on screen at the station blamed a CN network-wide system failure. For commuters, that meant little comfort. Well, I have a part-time job to go to, and I can't make that part-time job, so... And the person I work with is special needs, so they really rely on me. At stations all around the greater Toronto area, riders were left waiting and waiting. Uber prices began surging. A trip from downtown to Pearson Airport climbed to $68, then doubled within minutes, reaching $135. One Toronto-bound train from London got to Oakville, then just stopped for hours. We were stuck in that spot for about two and a half, three hours. And uh, now again, we're almost at Union and stuck again for, you know, how long? We don't know. CN's website appeared offline for much of the afternoon. The railway said it was experiencing an internet connectivity problem, adding there is no indication of a cybersecurity issue. A botched software update caused that massive Rogers outage last year, and CN is also blaming an internal system upgrade for this. There is a pipeline where data can be shared amongst all those systems, and that requires connectivity. And when one thing goes down, there seems to have been a ripple effect that has brought down multiple systems. By late afternoon, some trains started rolling again, with disruptions lasting well into the evening. CN says it's investigating the cause. It hasn't said why Canada's busiest transit hub was the one directly impacted. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A horrific crash in Venice, Italy has killed at least 21 people after a bus full of tourists fell off an overpass. Two kids are among the dead and we know that some of the victims were Ukrainian. The bus was bringing the tourists to a camping site. Venice's mayor called the crash apocalyptic and says the city is in mourning. Well, India is reportedly kicking out 41 Canadian diplomats. Neither government would confirm those reports. But when asked if Canada will retaliate, Justin Trudeau answered like this. We're not looking to escalate, as I've said. We are um, going to be doing the work that matters in uh, continuing to have constructive relations uh, with India through this extremely difficult time. India said last month that it wants parity in the country's diplomatic presences and that Canada's presence in India was much bigger. Ties between the two countries are strained after Trudeau accused the Indian government of being involved in the murder of a B.C. Sikh activist. The trial against a former RCMP intelligence official accused of breaking Canada's secret intelligence law is now underway. As Catherine Tunney explains, the Crown laid out its main contention that the accused allegedly leaked RCMP information to criminals. How are you feeling today, sir? Good, good. Cameron Ortis, once a top RCMP intelligence director, now on trial. Accused of trying to sell secret information to those tied to the criminal underworld. The Crown outlined their case to jurors, saying the RCMP was in the dark. Chad? until the FBI arrested this Canadian. Vincent Ramos ran a Vancouver company that was selling encrypted phones. According to the Crown, Mounties were invited to look at his computer and found an email with RCMP documents attached, which included details about an undercover agent. The sender was asking for $20,000 for more information. Police in the Crown allege the sender was Cameron Ortis. This is extremely unprecedented. Um, it's shaken the core of the public service and the security and intelligence community. A search of Ortiz's auto apartment uncovered more evidence of leaks, says the Crown, to people tied to a notorious money laundering network. Ortiz pleaded not guilty to all six charges against him. His lawyers say they believe he has a compelling story to tell and that he had the authority to do everything he did. The Crown says there was no evidence to suggest that Ortis was working undercover. Now, this is the first time that Security of Information Act charges have been tried, meaning the judge has to balance the rights of the accused with protecting national security. 
Catherine Tunney, CBC News, Ottawa. A letter written by Pope Francis this summer, but just made public, is making waves. It concerns same-sex unions and whether the Catholic Church could bless them. Julia Wong looks at the Pope's words and what they might mean. It's a reminder that, you know, Jesus is someone who is for the people in the margins. As a gay man and practicing Catholic, Mark Guevara sometimes has had crises of faith, but he's encouraged by comments from Pope Francis on same-sex unions. Having the blessing of the church means that the church walks with people like myself who are in uh, relationships. He's referring to Francis's response to conservative cardinals, that some same-sex unions could be open to a blessing if there was pastoral prudence and that they not necessarily become a norm, meaning they could be done on a case-by-case -case basis, says this Vatican expert. Change happens really quite slowly at the Vatican, so this is, a, this is an important statement and it's a deeply significant statement, but it's going to take a long time to figure out what the ramifications of it are. Underscoring that complexity, Francis reiterated church doctrine that same-sex relationships are objectively sinful. But he also said the church must do more than just deny, reject and exclude. A welcome message for many. There has been many instances of violence against gay people and the LGBTQ people community have been under attack. And, and a statement like this from the Pope I think does tremendous good in hopefully calming down these feelings. Others want him to go further. Right now, same-sex couples cannot receive the sacrament of marriage. Right now, gay men are told that they can't enter the priesthood. Many issues of equality will soon be discussed by the church. A major, nearly month-long meeting to outline the Catholic Church's future is set to begin at the Vatican on Wednesday. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. We're learning more tonight about the couple that was killed by a grizzly bear last week in Banff National Park. Jenny Guzzi and Doug Ingalls were longtime partners together for nearly four decades. An uncle of Ingalls confirmed their identities to CBC News. He says they were both scientists from Lethbridge and experienced hikers. A couple that, uh, that loved each other and were together and loved the outdoors. And they were highly, highly experienced in, in being out, being out back. Parks Canada says two cans of bear spray were found at the scene of the attack and that the couple were camping in a permitted area. The bear was shot and killed. Officials say the animal was not previously known to them, was old and underweight. New data tonight shows a growing number of adults are being put on medication to treat ADHD. I've certainly seen this trend happening in my own uh, clinical practice. The benefits and risks that have some doctors concerned. Next. Plus, is artificial intelligence a threat or an opportunity? You actually now have the ability to become a prompt engineer, is what it's called, to I be able to, be to create. Engineer. I want to be an artist. Yeah, that... Our panel breaks it down. And a little later, the transplant she got more than a decade ago. Oh my gosh, well, I cried when I saw him come down. A New Brunswick woman finally gets to meet the man who saved her life. We're back in two. Parks Canada says 150 wild horses died on Sable Island off the coast of Nova Scotia last winter. That's more than twice the annual average, but scientists don't expect this to be a threat to the viability of the herd, calling it a correction after growing to a record size last year. Scientists also say the horses are most vulnerable in the winter with their energy reserves lower and food sources just harder to find. Now, some doctors are raising red flags tonight about the number of Canadian adults using ADHD medication. Lauren Pelly with their concerns and what may be behind the rise. I take Vyvanse. It's one pill a day. David Martin was diagnosed with ADHD close to a decade ago. At the age of 46, the Toronto resident says medication finally helped him focus after years of struggling with time management and procrastination. I was more noticeable about dates and when things were coming up and doing things ahead of time. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, commonly treated with medication. 
New data from BC shows the rate of adults using ADHD medication has gone up dramatically, from one in a thousand adults in 2002 to nearly 17 in a thousand by last year. The new numbers were released in a letter sent to healthcare professionals by a group of medical experts. It warns some people can experience adverse effects from certain ADHD medications amid concerns the condition may be overdiagnosed. What to do if you think you have ADHD? Some doctors say social media videos are increasing awareness and encouraging more people to get ADHD assessments. I've certainly seen this trend happening in my own uh, clinical practice. This physician is among those worried more Canadians are seeking medications that are linked to rare health risks. I've seen um, heart conditions uh, that have been triggered by uh, the ADHD medication by uh, stimulants. But this social worker and therapist says for many adults a diagnosis can be a fresh start and meds are sometimes necessary. If we need glasses to support our vision, you know, society is less likely to show stigma toward that. Same goes for medication. In the decades before Martin got treatment for ADHD, he dreamed of going into computer science, but that career path didn't work out. Had I been diagnosed earlier, um, I wouldn't, I maybe wouldn't have that regret. And it's a regret he hopes other Canadians won't have to face. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Some drivers in the UK are feeling frustrated these days with new regulations forcing them into the slow lane. It's very frustrating. I've noticed on my commute to work, the traffic is backing up. The battle over speed limits in Wales and beyond. Plus, is AI coming for your job? We have algorithms that are running, monitoring patients as we speak. We look at both sides of the debate. What are you afraid of in this moment? I'd like to still have a job next year. The adapters and the opponents on our panel. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Aurora OPP members are currently on the scene of a tractor-trailer rollover. Well, that's a bit of a mess. A truckload of celery spilled all over a busy highway north of Toronto. It took a few hours to clean it all up, get traffic moving again. Police say no one was injured when that truck rolled over. Now to a growing controversy on the roads in the UK where there is a growing backlash to a decision to lower the speed limit in Wales. Chris Brown now with what's driving the change and the political reaction. In Wales, there's a joke that its famous red dragon has been usurped by a new creature, the snail. In a UK first, the Welsh government has lowered most speed limits in urban areas to a default 20 miles an hour, or 32 kilometres an hour. A snail's pace, say annoyed drivers. It's very frustrating. I've noticed on my commute to work, even on roads that are not 20 miles an hour, the traffic is backing up. We've now got a petition of 450,000 people who say it's a bad idea, get rid of it. Have you signed it? I certainly have. But there's strong evidence suggesting slowing down cars reduces accidents and injuries by up to 40%. And initially, there was broad support in Wales's Labour-led parliament. But with a national UK election a year out, going slow has now become a big issue far beyond Wales. Suddenly, this has become about a war on motorists. And the governing Conservatives see lowering speed limits as an issue they can campaign against. Instead of punishing motorists, Labour should be fo focusing on fixing public transport. Delivery companies have been among the most vocal opponents, claiming driving slower will add billions of pounds to costs, says a local representative. If an average driver does 30 deliveries in a day, that driver will still have the same number of deliveries to make every single day, even with 20 miles per hour. So in actual fact, they'll have to make less deliveries in a day. But advocates who pushed for the slowdown claim the rhetoric is overblown. Well, the evidence shows it is affecting journey times by between 30 and 45 seconds. The evidence isn't showing that, you know, it would make a big enough difference for it to affect deliveries. The hope is that safer streets will get more people biking and walking. And with public opinion polls suggesting most Welsh people want to give the slowdown a chance, the government says it won't be changing lanes. Chris Brown, CBC News, Cardiff. 
So this is the part of the show where we dig deeper into the story shaping our lives. Tonight, the seemingly unstoppable force that is profoundly changing the nature of work. This is The Breakdown. Is artificial intelligence coming for your job? Yeah, we are the prime targets. But as we debate the mind-boggling pros and cons, AI adapters insist it can be a force for good. Fewer patients are dying and everyone needs to adapt. Again, I don't want to do that. That's not why I do what and I do. And that's unfortunate because it is going to come. So we are talking about AI in the workforce. People are largely pretty divided, divided here too. I think fair to say over here we've got wary, maybe a little fearful. Over here, some full-on fans. Now, backstage, future of work economist Armin Yalnesian is listening in. We'll bring her in shortly. So, Dr. Mamdani, I'd like to start with you. Um, you work at Unity Health. You work with AI all the time. Wh what might surprise us about what AI has done in your workforce? Yeah, I think um, the implications of AI can be quite profound. In our emergency department, it has reduced human effort on simple tasks by over 80%. So tasks that normally take two to four hours every day by a few people, it's reduced to under 15 minutes. Error rates have went from over 20% to under 5%. What this algorithm does is it looks at historical data, all sorts of patterns. It scrapes the web for weather data to see if there's going to be a snowstorm tomorrow night. It looks for events like marathons on Lakeshore Boulevard on Sunday. With all of that, we can tell you Saturday from noon to 6, there'll be 80 patients waiting in the emergency department. 10 of them will have mental health issues. 12 of them will be hard to treat, the rest will be easier with between 94 to 96% accuracy. That helps us plan better, that helps us staff better, it helps us take care of our patients better. We've, we have algorithms that are running monitoring patients as we speak every hour on the hour. That has resulted in significant reductions in mortality. But th I'm gonna stop you because yeah. these, these sound like very important things that people used to do. So has anyone lost their job? There will be some mundane things where we won't need a person to do it. Those are going to be jobs that people I hear may mundane, not... and I think that's someone's whole job. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in some cases, I think we have to adapt to what's happening. Fewer patients are dying, and it's because our clinicians are able to pay more attention to the patients who need it. Our goal is for AI to enable us to provide more human-based care. The big thing with AI, and this is the confusion behind it, AI is only as good as the knowledge that you give it, like you saying with the medical staff and then how you ask, actually ask it the questions of the people who are giving it the answers. Without it, it's just something that can tell you how many cows are in the world. Like, it's, it's really not as powerful as people think. Okay, so, so Jeff McPherson, <laughs> everybody here, I, I think an AI shark is not a terrible phrase for you. Okay. Uh, because, <laughs> because you go into businesses and help them understand how to, how to work with AI. Correct. What I am curious about, though, because I know you have questions, mm -hmm. CL and, and, and Martin as well, as a writer mm -hmm. and as an illustrator, when you hear of the sorts of jobs that are on the AI chopping block, unfortunately, they pop up on the list all the time. So yeah, we are the prime targets. So what, what goes through your mind when you hear of sort of, it could save lives, the efficiencies? What I'm hearing is that these things are all really great, but it is early days. And I do kind of have a caution where I think, you know, all the more reason to examine the possible consequences and regulate them as quickly as we can. Um, because sometimes when you have a new innovation, it can get out ahead of basically the sober second thought that we rely on so much here in Canada. Um, personally, I'm a fantasy writer. Uh, I have four novels and a novella out, and I'm here to tell you that every single one of them has been scraped by ChatGPT. So what do you mean by that? What I mean is, is that content, every single word of those books that basically based my livelihood off of, um, has been scanned by a computer. Every single word of those books is inside the language model of ChatGPT. But let's say if somebody wanted a sequel, which I am not currently planning to write, they could go to ChatGPT and say, hey, write me a sequel to The Midnight Bargain. And when that happens, what happens to me? When was the first moment that you thought AI might be coming for me as an illustrator? Uh, when people started making uh, entire children's books over a weekend <laughs> mm -hmm. using chat GPT to write it and uh, you know imaging AI to make illustrations for it. What are you afraid of in this moment? Um, I'd like to still have a job next year, basically. 
I see AI uh, as being a really good tool that could be used art-wise. Um, if you need prompts for, say, I need to I need to draw a cityscape from a bird's eye view, you know, I can prompt that into AI and you know, it'll give me an idea of mm -hmm. a starting point, let's say, so then I could keep creating. Uh, but the problem right now in this industry is that it's almost treating art as if it's a problem. The only problem that we're having is because of greedy CEOs. You know, a money will make millions and millions of dollars, but they want to make more money, so they'll cut the artist completely. That's the problem. It's it's hard to get to get on board um, at this point, and it's moving so fast. And there's zero regulations, copyright issues, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. There's none, none. How long is it going to take for the government to even think about this? It should be used as a tool, but unfortunately, in the art industry, it's being used as a replacement mm -hmm. completely. Have you been what? replaced? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, as no I guess I, no, I could get contract contracts, but then I didn't get as many contracts last year. Is it because mm -hmm. because Buddy decided to, to do it himself with with the AI? I don't know. In a generation from now, why would you want to become an artist? Why would you want to become a, a writer if a computer could just do it? We don't do it for money. We do it because we like mm -hmm. it, right? But you also do it for money. For money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> at, the day, I, at the end of the day, that's what it's for. The efficiency, the productivity, to put profit in all of our pockets. That's that's mm -hmm. what it's for. If it can help you do that, it's going to it's going to make can. people happy. It, it is going to happen, and it is happening right now. Are we talking subjectively in the creative in the creative world, writing and art? Yes, 100%. But uh, from his point of view, it's super powerful. So how yes. can you pick AI being one side mm -hmm. um, a pro, but the other side a con because it could be going after your jobs? It's like, is it discouraging? Yes, but you actually now have the ability to become a prompt engineer is what it's called, to be able to, be to create. Engineer. I want to be an artist. Yeah, but that's yeah. just where the industry is going. So I don't find that a very good argument because there's nothing to adapt to. Me writing in three, four prompts to make an image mm -hmm. is nothing. Nothing. There's nothing to learn. It, Which I disagree. That's do. why these prompt engineers yeah. are making hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars a year. Yeah. But then are we all going to go back to school to learn this? You don't need to. Engineers? I think um, the approach we take is um, more around, I think, these emerging concepts of responsible AI. So this is where we have our clinicians, where we have our patients, we have people say, this is what's acceptable to us, mm -hmm. this is what's not acceptable to us. Mm -hmm. And that kind of sets the parameters around how we develop. You know, Ipsos Reid just had a poll recently suggesting that Canadians are among the least likely people in the world to feel, uh, I guess, confident or, or feel that um, AI is going to make their lives better. I'm curious about you, Jeff, because what is happening when you walk into a business? Like, how are you perceived and what are you doing? We're not there to be like, hey, we're going to replace the whole thing. But there's an opportunity if people can't keep up with the systems that we build in each department that you may not be there. So somebody can be a writer. We can take a hundred of their past blogs or emails that they've written, put it into the AI, and it will spit out new blogs as well as change language as well. That's just on the email marketing side. Same thing with customer service, same thing with sales, call centers and stuff like that. Do I have empathy to the fact that it can take people's jobs? Yes, but there's an opportunity for experts like yourselves to get ahead of it so you can be a part of it. And that's where it's super powerful. Again, I don't want to do that. That's not why I do what and I do. And that's unfortunate because it is going to come. I feel like it's invalidating us as humans right? at some point. It literally takes years to get good enough to do what we do. Have you been in a position where you say, you know, we're not going to do that because there are human beings here? Many times. Um, there, there are areas where I believe we can actually reduce staffing for example, mm -hmm. through efficiencies that we can gain from AI solutions using things like natural language processing to scour through notes and actually collect the information we need efficiently, where we could cut staff probably by about 20 to 30 percent would be my estimation. Mm. But is that the right thing to do? I don't think it is. How long is the ethical decision going to be the one that wins the day? This is why we, I think it's important for society to drive AI and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, is, is society driving AI? I mean, do, do you think the ethical decision will be the... In any industry, no matter what it is, there's good and bad. It's just which one can overpower the other. 
is, is the big thing. In the business world that we're in, it comes down to the bottom line and businesses, as they grow, that number needs to get larger while things start getting cut. And they're gonna implement AI just because it's, it's cheaper, faster, and it's scalable. Okay, so we need more faith in humanity here. Yes, <laughs> um, that's, that's gonna be the tough thing. Good luck. Okay, I'm gonna call time here for a second because th the problem is very clear, the solutions less so. Mm -hmm. This is why Armin Yelnesian is, is standing by watching. Armin's gonna come in and talk to us about a, a path forward here. I would love more regulation, but I fear that we don't know how to do it. And a company in North America may say, put the brakes on. That doesn't mean a company in Russia or China will. Absolutely correct. Okay, back to the urgent debate on AI and the possible threat to your job. Why would you want to become a writer if a computer could just do it? We've heard from anxious workers, but also eager adopters. Now for the broader view of where it's all going. We as humans are still in charge of the machines. That might not last longer if we all throw our hands up. Okay, Armin Yelnesian, um, if you haven't already met, is an economist with a specialty in the future of workers. Uh, I know you were listening in and I'm, you know, we're talking about a writer and an illustrator here. These aren't the only industries that need to be asking this question, right? 100%, it is terrifying to see the possibility of a creative force taking over human creativity. I get it. But it is happening everywhere in every industry, as Jeff mentioned. It's happening to coders. It's happening to translators. It's happening to engineers. It's happening to people working in law. What, what strikes you about what you heard here so far? This version of technology, as you've said a couple of times, Martin, is evolving very rapidly. And in a way that is human-esque, and its ability to almost think. We're not there yet, but we might be moving there faster than anybody has anticipated. In fact, never before in history have we been less sure of our predictions of what is about to happen, which means we should be much more cautious mm -hmm. about how we are approaching it, but that makes it harder to regulate because it is ha usually regulation happens after something terrible has happened, and now we can't even predict what the terrible thing that could be, that could happen. Nobody's thinking about the security aspect of AI, because there is gonna be the bad AI, like we've talked about, but there needs to be the guard against the bad AI coming. And there's gonna be people who are gonna be building bad AI to be able to replace jobs, scam people, stuff like that. 100%, have you had your great ethical technology lay off anybody? Yeah, I mean, uh, us personally, no, but we've gone into businesses where, yes, customer service, they're no longer there. Writers, they're no longer there. Salespeople, no longer there. So your technology that you have been asked to bring into a company has, in, in fact, led to higher unemployment in those companies? Correct. Okay. I just want to be clear that that is one purpose of this technology is to be labor-replacing. Correct. It is also to the doc good doctor's point, labor enhancing. I have been through, in my personal life as an economist, three waves of the robots are gonna eat all of the jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at, at the end of every wave of debate and existential hand-wringing, we have had more jobs. But this rodeo is different. You would say though, if, if I may, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mandani, that, that it's not just labor enhancing in this context. Is it, is it going too far to say it's, it's life-saving? We have a patient in the ICU right now where uh, it's a really unfortunate situation. Uh, that patient was bounced to three hospitals, three hospitals uh, before she came to ours and she had an intracranial hemorrhage or brain, a brain bleed, uh, missed, uh, unfortunately. And, and all, you know, nobody can point fingers and say, uh, why didn't you do X or Y? It's just, that's how the healthcare system works. Um, we have an algorithm that detects brain bleeds in less than 30 seconds using AI. Had that been uh, available, deployed, the right steps taken, she may not be where she is today. Mm -hmm. So can I just double down on sure. this? What is the data we are feeding these machines on will define, and what is the purpose to which we are asking the machines to solve problems for us, will define who gets hurt, who gets helped. I, I would love more regulation, but I fear that we don't know how to do it that the technology is evolving too quickly, that's one issue. 
that the ownership of the technology is by such large corporate entities. And a company in North America may say, put the brakes on. That doesn't mean a company in Russia or China will. Absolutely correct. And we are competing with everybody on who and what is going to control this technology that we are developing as humanity around the world in real time. I'm curious about at, at this level, you know, depending on where you are in your career. Yeah. What on earth do you do? Somebody asked me the other day, I have an 18 year old that's thinking about going into coding. It's like, is AI gonna eat his future? And my answer was, would you have said that to an accountant? Somebody that wanted to study accounting when we introduced the hand calculator? Mm -hmm. Of course not. It's a tool that made everybody's jobs easier and faster. Awesome. AI could code. We should all, especially young people, should be much more conversant about technology in a world that is dominated by technology. We as humans are still in charge of the machines. That might not last longer if we all throw our hands up and say- Give it six months, yeah. Right? Like if that's what we're saying, yeah. give it six months, it'll come. It'll come faster if we give up control. At our hospital, we, we have a saying that is, you know, not ours, it's, we've heard it from others, is that AI is not gonna replace clinicians but clinicians who use AI are gonna replace clinicians who don't use AI. If you have, I don't know, between three and six years left in your career, or six to 10 years, or 20 years left, what should you be doing if you're at each of those stages? It's actually the 25 to 54 year olds that really need to up their game. And of course, universities and colleges and high schools should be teaching every child everything they know about every generation of this technology because it is changing fast and learn how to use it so it isn't used against you. Armin, Martin, Ciel, Dr. Mamdani, Jeff, thank you very much. So this conversation is far from over. We only touched on some of the jobs and professions that AI is reshaping, possibly replacing. So tell us about AI and your job. You can reach us at the national at cbc.ca. We want to hear from you. Coming up, an emotional meeting more than 10 years in the making. He saved my life, he's my hero. You know, he is truly, truly my hero. A lasting friendship forged in blood. That's next in our moment. Well, Sheila Crotty from New Brunswick and Cody Jordan from Mississippi live half a continent apart, but a bone marrow transplant in 2012 brought them very close together. Through emails and phone calls, the pair have built a deep connection over the past 10 years, but this weekend, Cody finally made the trip to Canada. Their long-awaited meeting is our moment. I'm breathing, I'm above ground, you know, because of Cody. And I just love him, I do. It was in like December 2011 that I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My only chance was for an unrelated donor because none of my family matched. I got a call, they alerted me that they had a, a match. So what I went through is called peripheral blood stem cell collection and get on a plane and all we knew at that time was it was going to Canada, which, you know, for being in Mississippi, that, that was, seemed pretty wild. And then a nurse comes running down the hallway and they have this little, like a cooler, and in it is a bag of blood. And that, then we became blood. <laughs> I cried when I saw him come down. And I was like, wow. Like not only did he save my life, but they're coming and visiting me. He saved my life, he's my hero. So Sheila says that it's slight, but Cody's accent is very popular there and that some of the locals are out running around saying y'all all the time. Um, but also she said he's the reason that she lived to 60, that she bought a house, that she was able to see her granddaughter grow up. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenault. Take care.